I'm very excited to introduce uh, Commissioner, uh, Federal Election Commissioner Shana Broussard. Um, she's joining us today. Um, she has been with the FEC since 2008, um, been commissioner since 2021. Um, and so she's going to share with us um, a little bit about uh, their uh, initiatives and goals, um, what they do, how they do it, um, and then we'll open it up to questions. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. So if I understand correctly, you were just talking about extremism. So sometimes you'll see that in campaign finance as well, um, quite a bit. So um, first, my name is Shauna Broussard, and I am a commissioner at the Federal Election Commission. I prepared a speech, so I'm going to go through it, but then I'm happy to be able to answer any questions. And I'm happy to be able to give you some guidance as to where you can find answers or who the person can, is at the FEC that can get you answers. But let me share first, Shauna Broussard, um, my email, and I'll say it again, but if you want my email, and here's a hint, if you want anyone's email at the FEC, take their first name initial and their last name, slap it on top of at FEC.gov and you have their email. So my email is sbroussard at FEC.gov. That's the, the first tip. You can reach anybody at the FEC, it's not complicated, but it's probably like that for most federal agencies too. So I'll jump in. Um, I wanna first say thank you for inviting me to be here today. Um, as I mentioned, I am a commissioner at the Federal Election Commission. I am one of six commissioners, all of whom are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. By law, the commission, the commission cannot have more than three individuals from any single party. So currently, I am a Democratic commissioner, uh, along with, uh, I serve with three Republican commissioners, one other Democrat, and other independent commissioner. And if you're a little bit familiar with our world, we just had a confirmation hearing. So we had a confirmation hearing that confirmed Dara Lindenbaum, and she will be joining the commission hopefully sometime soon, probably the midsummer, uh, and she will be replacing the independent commissioner, Stephen Walther. If, a little bit the background wise, I've worked at the commission since 2008, and at first as a staff attorney in the enforcement division, and then as counsel to the current vice chair, Stephen Walther, and then I became a commissioner myself in December of 2020. The year that I became a commissioner was kind of considered an overhaul year because that was a year that two Republicans joined and I joined also the commission. And traditionally you would have been paired by two, but this was a little bit of a break in tradition as we're seeing in the world of politics now. So it's a little bit different, but we are still learning the roadmap of each other and I think coming along pretty well. Let me give you an overview because Ann thought an overview of the agency might be helpful for you to understand. Um, the FEC or the commission that I'm gonna refer to throughout this little talk is the federal agency in charge of regulating money and politics. And it was created by Congress in the aftermath of the Watergate political scandal which involved, we all know, secret illegal donations to the Nixon campaign. Congress recognized that a properly functioning democracy requires a well-informed public and that citizens should know how money is used to influence elections and that they should be armed with the knowledge that when they go into the poll booth, they know how money has been spent. The commission has exclusive jurisdiction over the civil enforcement of federal campaign finance laws. As such, our responsibilities include collecting and disclosing campaign information, finance, uh, who is raising and spending money on elections, enforcing provisions of the Federal Election Campaign Act, which is the law governing finance. You'll hear us, uh, if you ever come to the open meetings, we'll say the act or FICA or something like that, and overseeing the public funding of presidential elections. The commission, we issue regulations, advisory opinions, policies and procedures, all to guide the regulated community in complying with the law. And we can find you. We have civil jurisdiction, but the unique basis of this agency is that while we have civil jurisdiction, DOJ has criminal jurisdiction. And sometimes you'll hear about a case that started with us, but had knowing and willful violations, so then it transferred over to DOJ. And, and a lot of times you're gonna hear about cases where we exercise our prosecutorial discretion um, we're a small agency, obviously DOJ is not. And in a use of our resources, it might be better for DOJ to take over the case and pursue it in a criminal capacity as opposed to us expending the limited resources that we have. 
So I view the mission of the FEC as strengthening our democracy and protecting the integrity of the federal election campaign finance process. One, by providing transparency to the public about money used in elections, disclosure, and two, by fairly enforcing and administering our federal campaign finance laws. Now, one of the important tasks that we do at the agency is that we collect and report campaign finance data. All federal committees, super PACs, and other groups spending money to influence our elections must report their political activities. For campaigns and PACs, that means spending, that means reporting who is financing your organization as well as reporting how you're spending your money. And then anyone paying for independent expenditures or electioneering communications have to file reports disclosing that activity. A division that I anticipate most of you will get to know pretty well is the reports analysis division. And that receives the information. It reviews the reports and it sends what we call RFAIs, which are reports for additional information that sometimes look at what they think might be a mistake or a potential violation. These RFAIs are a part of the public record and they can sometimes be the source of news articles on a campaign's potential missteps. And a lot of times when I read the articles that are coming through in our news and views, it's reporters such as yourself that have combed through those RFAIs and have brought a highlight to an attention. So this is one of the reasons I wanted to highlight this resource that you probably already know about. But if not, please look at it. It also tells you the campaign analyst that is working on a case. Now, they should not be talking to you, but whatever they do confidentially is above, <laughs> look, is beyond whatever I want to control. I can't regulate that. That's free speech. So um, that is just one of the resource tools that we have available. All of this information, RFAIs, contribution information, spending information is all publicly posted on our website at www.fec.gov. But the unique thing about our information is that we put it out there and there are organizations like Open Secrets that then take that information and aggregate the information. But you can go straight to our website. But just to let you know, we look at Open Secrets as well. So it is a good resource in aggregating. It, it might sound bad for the government to say this, but other times resources are better at putting together out of the bureaucracy of what we're dealing with. Um, it's a big job collecting all of this information, especially as campaign spending continues to grow. And it's growing drastically. Spending in 2020 election cycle, 14, a cycle was nearly $14.4 billion. It's more than double than the six and a half billion that was spent in the 2016 election cycle. And it's making it the, by far the most expensive election ever. Nine of the 10 most expensive Senate races in history occurred in the 2020 election cycle, as well as five of the, five of the 10 most expensive House races. And looking ahead at the 2022 midterm elections, which we're all excited about, at least maybe if you work in the campaign fan, it's still you are. Um, I've seen projections of $9 billion that are being spent on this, which is being spent on political advertising alone, spending alone. <laughs> It's more than total the spending in the 2018 midterms. So it's therefore critical that this, the FEC, be a well-functioning organization that promotes democracy by the importance of disclosing information. So I know I'm dealing with the press here, and one of the things that we want to highlight is that the role that you have in sharing information is integral to the agency's fundamental mission of promoting transparency in elections. We have a great staff and they do a fantastic job of collecting and making public contributions and expenditure information. But all of you are often the ones bringing that information to the attention of the American public. I don't think it goes without saying that the American public is not spending their time on the FEC's website. It is not the most exciting thing. And granted, I work there. But it is important then that we have information available for individuals such as yourself to be able to call attention to what is happening in campaign reports. The press articles are oftentimes how complainants and enforcement matters first learn of potential violations of laws before bringing that issue to us. Let me give you a little example. And I'm gonna tell you about two cases, but in the experience that I have, um, I handled a case, I'm not sure if anyone's gonna even remember, there was a former Senator, Larry Craig. Anyone, is, does the name even strike anyone's? <laughs> there you go, I see a hand raise. So, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, is there 
are you from the state of? Okay, okay. Uh, so, <laughs> Senator Craig um, was arrested. Um, it was a little, I'd say, infamous in a, in a way that Senator Craig was arrested while he was in the bathroom with uh, allegedly arrested for allegedly soliciting. Um, let's just say we all know what he's soliciting. So, uh, so <laughs> that case. Um, I ended up handling that case, which ended up going to litigation, and we pursued personal use violations against the senator. Uh, essentially, he was using campaign funds to pay to overturn his conviction, and he pled. Uh, and the allegations and what we brought forth and what I push is that that's a violation of the personal use provisions. That arrest would have ex existed irrespective of his status as an office holder. He was not engaged in office holder activity when he was in the bathroom. But the reason I bring it up to all of you is because we would have never considered this case, but for an individual complainant sitting in his home state, reading the newspaper and thinking something is wrong with that. He wrote in a complaint, a handwritten complaint. I still remember a handwritten complaint that came in and that ended up being a case that's very prominent in our personal use regulations and has expanded the law of personal use. And it's all because a news article written by one of your associates and your peers um, brought this attention to the public. So I hope that just lets you know how important it is and how important we consider the work that you do. Now, just recently, the commission settled enforcement matters with two companies, Zuckelman Industries and Wheatland Tube, for alleged violations involving the prohibition against foreign nationals being involved in US elections. Wheatland Tube made contributions totaling $1.75 million to the Super PAC America First Action, and a Canadian citizen appears to have been exercised some decision-making over contributions. It's not allowed under campaign finance laws. The obvious is that you cannot give donations uh, as a foreign national. But the less obvious and one of the most important factors that we consider is a foreign national can be, not be involved in this decision-making to make a contribution. Now, the respondent ended up paying one of the largest civil penalties that we've recently received, $975,000, nearly a million dollars in penalties. But I want you to think about this. This is not the kind of violation that we can uncover just by looking at contribution reports. You, you, you can't look at that report. It's not gonna say, hey, Canadian involved in this one. We, we don't write those down on reports. What happened is, is that a watchdog group filed a complaint after citing and reading a New York Times article and it reported that the Canadian citizen had participated in the decision-making process. So again, this is an example of the work that you do in going through these reports or the minutia that you have to contend with at times to be able to bring an issue to light that we don't have the resources to dig through and our reports don't reflect in, let's be honest, how many people are gonna tell us that a foreign national is involved in this if you know it's a violation? Uh, yeah, they're not gonna do it. Um, there was another recent enforcement matter where reporters went undercover as fictitious foreign nationals allegedly interested in contributing $2 million to Great American PAC, another super PAC. Uh, we ended up conciliating with the PAC over allegations that they knowingly and willfully solicited contributions from a foreign national. Now, the PAC agreed to a $25,000 penalty, but it, that might seem insignificant compared to the $975,000. The difference in the two is how do you quantify the damage when you actually have a contribution made and one in a sting operation where you're trying to get one made. And so that instance, you don't have an amount in violation that seems proportionate and you ended up, we end up considering a statutory penalty and something to that effect. So again, these are two examples that came to us and it resulted in very positive decisions for the commissions that are direct relationship to what the work that you're doing. So uh, the cases highlight how valuable it is that we have a healthy press reporting on potential violations. And by statute, we can't conduct an investigation unless four commissioners agree that there's reason to believe. Did you get that? Four. <laughs> and three of us are on one side and three of us are on another side. So consensus is the pathway to success at the commission. We don't have investigative powers to interview witnesses or subpoenas before that RTB stage. And of course, I would just wanna say this, while I think what you're doing is extremely important, 
we don't rely only on your articles, but when we consider the complaints and the responses, the evaluate the law, the facts, the press articles, the well-developed record that you usually present in your articles, that you guys are the ones that blow the whistle and you bring it to our attention. And so we are, we are grateful for that and do look at that information. Now, I've given you an example of where I think you guys are so vital to what we do, but let me tell you where the commission has some challenges. And that was some successes. And I think there's even more successes. We were in a, I was a chair last year. We'll get into that a little bit later if you have any questions. But one of the challenges that we have is we have outdated laws and regulations. Um, also, because I told you it takes four commissioners to agree to change anything. So finding consensus on something that is outdated is a challenge. I already mentioned the amount of money that's being spent in the last decade, but it's created the, the challenges in the regulation of finance because of our outdated laws. So for instance, political advertising continues to shift from traditional sources, such as television and radio to texting and online, including social media platforms and streaming services. And as I look around, I'm just kind of curious, if, if you don't mind, if I, it's okay, to, like how, television? Is it television? I don't know how this, actually you guys need to educate me. I see what I believe is traditional paper, Post Gazette. I see the Washington Post. I see CQ. I see, um, look, forget Next Star Media. We just had a case with you guys not too long ago. Um, it was good. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> good news for you guys. Good news for all of you based in that case. So um, I hope I didn't make you uncomfortable, Mr. Hudson. So like, but um, I see ABC News. I see New York Times. So I see what I appear and you have to educate me with traditional press and I see television and I see online. Am I missing anything in, in that scope of stuff? You guys tell me. Radio, thank you, thank you. That it's very important. I didn't forget the radio. Don't worry. <laughs> like, like, we're we're still there. <laughs> so, um, but but it's interesting that we say this is that what traditionally political campaigns came through and political information was disseminated through the newspaper, and I even still think of it first, which might be a representation because I'm just maybe four or five years older than you guys, just barely, 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 <laughs> barely. That's, you, you guys didn't have to laugh at that part and everything. Um, <laughs> but it's shifting from the traditional sources of television and radio, and it's now moving online. Americans receive their news by turning on one of these things. Or more, I put mine up because I was trying to be respectful. Your telephone is how you get your news and everything. Um, whether you like it or not, this is the evolution of the dissemination of information in this country. And I believe it's the evolution of dissemination in this world. I will always have a love for the traditional press and reading it in a piece of paper. Um, whether I read it with the holding the paper in my hand or digital, but we have to go where the individuals are going and you have to get the news out to them the way that they are more likely to see it because that promotes real disclosure. So we don't have robust regulations in this area. And it could be, an argument could be made that if you are on one side of the aisle, you are more um, pro-disclosure. And if you're on another side of the aisle, you are, well, like we like to say, not pro-disclosure. So depending on where you might stand on that, you might decide that we need more regulation or we need less regulation of the internet and things like that. And that's usually the fear that people are like, they're trying to control our internet. We're trying to control. No, I'm not trying to control your internet. I'm trying to make sure that when you look at it, you know who is responsible for the spending of this and who has authorized this communication. It makes a very big difference when you know that a candidate was involved with the communication as well as a third party paid for the communication. So 
it's kind of dangerous when we don't have a sufficient regulation because we consider the widespread use of disinformation in campaigns. And we've all gone through it. You, you guys have seen it, the 2016 election when the Russian Federation engaged in extensive social media campaigns and micro-targeting of political advertising as a means of spreading disinformation. So it's not in dispute. And if you do dispute it, then I don't know, y'all the press, like, but I don't know why. Um, but we need to grapple with is, do we have sufficient triggers in our disclosures and disclaimer obligations? And how does the agency develop a framework for determining when those advertisements seek to influence uh, federal elections? And does it matter to the analysis whether the tactics are used by a domestic or a foreign actor? I don't know about you guys, but yes. When a foreign actor is involved in the disinformation of or information sharing and slighting of information to the American public, our democracy is in danger. Um, but regardless of how the commission addresses these issues going forward, online tactics pose real challenges to election spending transparency. There's been a decisive shift. We've all seen it and everybody basically just acknowledged it and agreed with it. And Mr. Radio in the back, please forgive me, that was not intended. I love radio, but I'm on Sirius XN most of the time, so I'm probably missing all the good stuff anyway. So sorry about that one. Um, the commission has to do more to enforce existing disclosure laws, but at the same time, we must be strengthened to respond to the online advertising world as there's rapid technological changes. <sighs> For instance, the definition of public communication, uh, I'm not sure if, if this might be in the weeds for you guys, but the definition of public communication for the FEC, um, public communication that expressly advocate the election or defeat of federal candidates are subject to disclosure and disclaimer requirements. But the commission has been unable to agree on a rationale with respect to disclaimer for ads placed on social media platforms. The difference is, is essentially, if you're on the TV, we can regulate you. If you're on a piece of paper, we can regulate you. But if you're on the internet, we have challenges in making sure that disclosure and disclaimer information is provided because this agency has not updated its regulations to sufficiently address. Now we're in the process of working on that right now. And um, I'm on the regulations committee and we are making an active effort. And I think we will have something I hope before the year closes. I would love to say sooner but that would be overestimating how the government works. And, but the thing is, and the problem is, is that as we continue to kind of try to map away, technology is going even more. So you have to be considerate of, are we creating something that can last a measurable test of time? And I, and I think that's part of the challenge with it is that um, when these, these ads, when these regulations were done years ago, the internet was just kind of a little blip in the screen and people were still believing Al Gore created it and all that kind of stuff like that. But um, now it's expanded to that we're moving beyond in so many degrees and so many progressions that it's a challenge for us as we look at regulations, how can we prepare to really make measured addresses for what's going to happen in the future? And, and it, I have to be honest with you, you, you have to kind of sometimes decide We've got to put a stopping point, and this is as best as we can figure out how to regulate, and then make a commitment to coming back later. That's it. Um, there's a number of cases that we recently handled, or press cases. Um, where Mr. Hudson's uh, next, next star is one of the cases. We had some Twitter cases. We had a couple of cases that I'd invite you all, if you look it up on the agency website, and look at those cases, because you'll see how the commission creates a, and creates the distinctions between those entities and those organizations. And if you need to find it, you know my email address, email me and I'll send you the link to it or something like that. Or someone in my office will, don't worry, we'll get it to you. Um, dark money. And I wanna make sure that I give you enough time because I'm worried about that, it, like running over your time. Another challenge that we always face uh, is the unprecedented use of dark money in elections. As we all know, in 2010, there's a Supreme Court decision that invalidated the FEC's ban on corporate and union spending on independent expenditures. And that lovely decision is, I bet if we all said it together, we could say it, like 
Do you want to take a guess? You all want to guess what it is? I'll start. Citizens United. <laughs> right. Look, everybody was correct. You guys all got it. Um, the court explained that the prohibition at the time acted as a ban on free speech in violation of the First Amendment. But at the same time, um, the court linked uh, to another holding that reaffirmed the constitutionality of disclosure obligations, which is important. Because if you were at the agency at the time when Citizens United came through, there was a, a level of, I'll say it for me, defeat. You were, you were kind of like, what do we do? What is the purpose of this agency now if we can't try to regulate that? And you have to remember, we still have the responsibility to make sure that disclosure is coming out to the public and that you know who is responsible and behind these communications. So in the majority opinion, Justice Kennedy explained that the court's ruling would lead to new campaign finance system that pairs corporate independent expenditures with effective disclosure. It hasn't happened. <laughs> It hasn't happened. Transparency, the court explained, enables the electorate to make informed decision and give proper weight to different speakers and messages. Ideally, that is what it should be doing. But these organizations have found a way to circumvent that disclosure requirement. And so that is the case in theory. It's how it should be. But in the aftermath, that has not come into fruition. A significant amount of election-related spending is taking place in secret especially on the internet. Massive amount of money are flowing from wealthy donors to corporations to super PACs and other corporate entities misrepresenting and masquerading as nonprofit social welfare groups. And the commission is frequently confronted with the issues of whether to what extent corporate and union spending to influence elections should be disclosed, including whether 501c4 groups uh, political spending rise to a level that they become deemed political committees um, by the agency, which if you don't know, the uniqueness of that is once you become a political committee, you are required to report with the agency and you do not stop reporting until you are terminated by the agency. So there is the effort, expense and work that goes into something like this. And also once you become a political committee, that is the true essence of disclosure. We are able to see, you're supposed to be showing us and writing out everything that you're doing, every expenditure operation. Now, we've had a little bit of progress, I'm happy to say, is that uh, four commissioners were able to come up with a bipartisan statement that making it clear that we are no longer going to turn a blind eye to contributions through LLCs to mask their identities. Um, we've faced many cases since Citizens United where they set up the LLCs, they route the money through the LLCs and the super PAC, and then they report the money is coming from the LLC, when the LLC is really not the recipient of the monies. And oftentimes these cases are, you're going to see these transactions happening. A, a millionaire A gave uh, an LLC that just was created two days ago, um, $5 million. And then the very next day, oh, LLC has no money in it except for that $5 million. And then they turned over and made a well, $4,750,000 so they can have a little money on the books left contribution to this super PAC. There is a strong suggestion that that organization was created solely for the purpose of funding that super PAC. Not always the case, but it's a strong suggestion and then when individuals such as yourself dig through the record a little bit more, look at the 990s, um, talk to the directors or the officers, you are the individuals that oftentimes point out things to us that bring it worthy of a complaint that we can look into this. Now, what we've done is in these instances, in these cases, we decided we came together and Everyone now is on notice that we're going to enforce our reporting and in con con conduit contribution rules in this context. And that case, um, in case you want to ever look at that statement of reasons done by the commission, is called Blue Magnolia. It's MERS 7454. Now, unfortunately, that's just one way, and there's still plenty of other dark money ways. And I wanted to give you some of the problems with the agency, not just the challenges with the law, but... Um, one of the challenges with the agency is that it takes a bipartisan effort to get anything accomplished. We have a lot of 3-3 splits, and a lot of times that's based on ideological differences and how we interpret the law. Um, some 
let's say, maybe you shouldn't say this to the press, but you'll, we'll say it, is that there have been recent articles that are questioning whether um, we are taking a more partisan stance uh, and looking at cases and making decisions on how we conclude some cases. Um, for example, the Daily Beast recently reported that our attorneys have recommended finding reason to believe that a violation occurred in 22 separate matters involving the former president, Ms., uh, President Trump. And we didn't move forward on a single one. You need four votes to be able to do that. I haven't confirmed all of those numbers, but I know that there have probably been many, many cases that should have gone forward. And, and looking at some of those cases, um, I'm a former prosecutor, so I probably look at it in a little more of a vein of believing the information that's before me. Um, reason to believe is a very initial stage. Uh, it's, it's the start of this process. Reason to believe is, is a descriptive term that who, how do we define it? It's not necessarily defined or written anywhere. So it becomes a subjective determination as to whether a violation has occurred. But it's the starting point. And um, I find it hard sometimes to believe that in 22 cases, but the information that has been developed by all of you, that we couldn't move forward on some of these cases. Maybe all of them didn't have merit, but I think some of them probably should have gone, a, gone another step above. So we have a bipartisan deadlock issue, and we also have a backlog and staff shortage. Uh, when I was the chair of the agency uh, and took over in 21, 2021, yeah, we had 400 cases that were backlogged. And that's because we didn't have a quorum for about 19 months. So we could not move forward on cases. So my agenda during that year became essentially, we need to eliminate this backlog so that we can pursue some of these cases that are very serious violations. And, and I will say with the backlog and a staff shortage, they really put the effort in and we were able to reduce that backlog by the agency. I'm quite proud of the time that I was served as a chair. It was a lot of hard work and everybody put together and did it. Um, we now, if you don't know this, but it serves, a Democrat serves as chair one year, a Republican, we flip-flop, we flip-flop. And um, so I just finished the, the term as the Democratic chair of the agency, and now we have um, commissioner, chairman, excuse me, Alan Dickerson. And our backlog is starting to grow a bit. Uh, we are now have um, maybe 70 cases, which is not really that bad when you think about it, because when I took over, we had 400. So... We, I believe I left it in a good place for us to be able to kind of move things forward. Um, but we're an understaffed agency. Um, the last I numbers I looked at, we had 297 full-time employees. But in 2009, compare that with, we had 359 employees. Uh, so we don't simply have all the staff that we need. And I think that's a fair assessment for all the divisions, the reporting division that you'll come into quite a bit, the enforcement division where the reports are drafted. Um, that's the challenges that we're facing, but I wanna let you know that the information on our agency website is truly accessible. And if you have difficulties with it, call the information division. They will help you and point you in the right directions and give you some just basic guidance onto the law. and. We also have, and I wanted to make sure that you know that our press office, um, Judy Ingram, and I told you her email, everybody got it, um, Judy Ingram, Christian Hillbrand, these are wonderful resources that will help you. They will also help you if you need to get in touch with one of the commissioners. I, I mean, I gave you the email address. There's a formal external one. I gave you the better one. Don't even bother with it, honestly. Um, but check with Judy and they can help you find just about anything that you need. They can help you make contacts with any of us if you wanna talk with us. And feel free to come to the open meetings. We are now returned to the agency where we're having those meetings in public. Uh, the open meeting is, we have closed meetings where we discuss these the confidential cases still. And then we have the open meetings where we invite you to attend. They're, they're not the most exciting, but it is where you can get the best access to these commissioners if you need to ask them questions. So I probably went over the time and everything, but I'm happy to entertain any questions, Anne. My name's Ryan, I'm with the Arkansas Paper. Uh -huh. um, uh, 
But uh, I had a question. Um, there's, I wanted to pick your brain about how uh, there's basically this case where the NRA has, uh, ha there's been this complaint where I think it was like the Center for Legal, a nonprofit has basically sued, uh, sued the FEC, saying the FEC is not acting on their complaints against the NRA in regards to their campaign finance th um, things. And then a federal judge has granted a private right of action. And so now this like nonprofit is suing the NRA directly um, instead of the FEC because the judge has concluded that the FEC isn't moving forward on their mm -hmm. complaints regarding the, N the NRA money. And I guess I was wondering, like, do you have any like hot takes on that? Or where, where do you think <laughs> that kind of stands? Like, I mean, hot is takes. that the right way to be doing business? Or is it like kind of where we're at right now? And that's like maybe the best so. way forward? <laughs> Hot takes is right. Um, so the agency has been sued as, uh, not NRA has been sued as a private right of action. It is allowed in the statute. It's a unique circumstance. Um, it's going to be one of those things where I say, watch what's happening in the case, but commenting at it as a commissioner, um, it's, I can't really get into those things right now. But um, I do say, look at the statute. The statute does call for those instances, whether or not you agree with that position of this being a way. I think there was a statement that Commissioner Weintraub put out. Um, I invite you all to look at it. I want to say 2019, 2020. Uh, if I might be wrong, reach out to me and email me and I'll, and I'll find it for you and everything. And um, her office will get it to you instantly if you need it. But it explained at least her theory for what's happening in the agency. And one of the things I wanna note is we talked about, we had, we have a new group of commissioners now, and I think it's, um, I think there's a much more productive and bipartisan effort, but there was a period at the commission as a person that's worked there for 14 years, that I do think that there was a significant uh, divide, let's say, <laughs> like, like, Significant divide. Yeah, I was kind of thinking. What is her name? Sophia. <laughs> Sophia. That was a that was a kind word of saying it, huh? Um, a significant doubt divide that made it super challenging to be able to move forward on things that on one side felt like obvious violations. So they they are really great and they take their work very. They they I will tell you this. Judy actually, when I told her I was coming here, she's like, I love them. I love. I mean, so. Like, <laughs> Uh, so please reach out to them. You know, you know, we can help. And we're, I'm working, I, you know, this sounds like homily, but I work for you. I, I'm working at a federal agency that all of you are the contributors to. So I do take it as a responsibility to, to be, you're my stakeholders. I want to make sure that I give you what you need. Hi, I'm Kirk Bader with National Journal. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your time today. FEC quarterly filing day is like a holiday at our office, so yes. we always have a fun time with it. Uh, two questions for you here. Uh, first off, there's been obviously an explosion of money in campaigns and politics mm -hmm. ever since the uh, FEC decision. And politics and campaigning has become a massive business, especially in the online world. Yep. How are you guys looking at regulating some of these like pop-up shops or consultants who are specializing in digital advertising and then you know getting involved in a lot of small dollar fundraising is there any conversation about regulating some of these like fly-by-night operations with campaigning or is it just mm -hmm. too decentralized to even think about regulating so that's a, it kind of makes me think of scam packs when you're talking about that mm -hmm. um so uh, and if, if I'm, are you guys familiar with scam packs do you know what the is, okay, a scam pack is a consider. Well, first let me let me back up because my, on the opposite side, my my not my opponents but my colleagues would say there is no definition for a scam pack. It has not. It has not. You guys came up with a great name for it, and we love it, and so we use it on this side at least. Is that a scam pack is a considered to be a political committee that um, registers with the commission, raises, so, uh, solicits funds. Um, it could be on behalf of a candidate, but generally they're non-connected, where they just raise a ton of money for fundraising, solicitations, digitals, fundraising, solicitations, digitals, consulting, consulting, consulting. And when you look at their records, there are no expenditures that are being made for independent expenditures. Now, your goal is supposed to be supporting or opposing a candidate uh, or a party, and nothing is being spent on that. 
One of the problems that we have is that we do not have a statute or a regulation on point that allows us specifically to be able to call those organizations out. And we have gone to the legislative recommendations of last year, um, I pushed the legislative recommendations because we hadn't had them for a couple of years. So we were able to send that up to Congress. There were a couple of senators, um, Senator, Senator Klobuchar and Senator King were taking a lead on considering some kind of legislation to be able to do this. I personally am 100% behind this kind of legislation because uh, I had one of the cases, not one of the earliest ones, but a case I had when I first started with the agency was Honeycutt for Congress. And simply said is that this was a Democrat, no, this was a Republican candidate in a highly Democratic district. So this was a woman, a black woman, black Republican running for office in Atlanta, highly Democratic district. Um, she had a, his, he's no longer living and we, he was DOJ indicted him. So uh, Scott McKenzie was his name. Um, Scott McKenzie became her campaign consultant and helped her raise hundreds of thousands of dollars. And when I first got this, I was looking, I, I have to say I was looking at this rather naively and I was like, how is this woman getting money? She's running in Atlanta. She has no shot of prevailing. And that's probably wrong to say, but at the time, she had no shot of prevailing. She and how on such a low budget, when I'm looking at the, the her advertisements, which were at Kinko's with little, you know, elephants tattooed and donkeys like taped on her, her, her mailers and her communications. How is, if she's raising all this money, why isn't it matching what she's doing? And it was because um, you have these organizations that um, create these entities that take advantage of the digital atmosphere to be able to solicit money and then not do anything what the purpose of the agency is. Now, one of the things that we were able to do last year, is, and it didn't go as far as I would like, is that we were able to modify our um, website so that when you pull up a candidate or a committee, uh, it'll show you the percentages that are being spent. So it gives what I hope is an opportunity for one of you or someone who wants to give their money to go look at that and decide, do I want to give my money to a non-connected committee that has 500000 and have not spent a single penny on an independent expenditure? Are they really supporting what I'm in favor of? So we've got to work to create the transparency for those things. I think I see it as the newest kind of, it's not scam, but the newest type of way to be able to promote the lack of disclosure because we are not giving people the adequate information about who is a legitimate worker and actor in our field. One more, speaking of scams, sure. there's been an explosion of crypto bat money in <laughs> the campaign cycle this year. You know, Protect yeah. Our Future Pact is putting 22 million across mm -hmm. all these congressional races. How is the agency approaching these type of organizations where they're spending real dollars, but they're backed by this widely unregulated currency? Yeah. And also follow up to that, what about campaigns that are, campaigns, committees, or PACs that are now accepting payments in crypto or are mm -hmm. selling NFTs? Is the uh, commission looking at regulating that at all? Or what are those tots look like? So um, do we have something currently in place? No. We don't. Um, most of these new things, such as the crypto, have come through the AO process, and we have had some very limited advisory opinions that have started to address that. But what you said exactly is this is exploding, and it is a technology that we have to get ahead. And not to badmouth my place where I, where I call home, we haven't finished internet disclaimer regulations yet. So if we haven't done that, for how the hell are we getting the crypto? And, and we do need to stay on top of it. This is where, um, I don't think you guys can do it, but go to other organizations and write in for a rulemaking and suggest it. We, of course, can initiate our own rulemakings, but I believe it has sometimes a greater weight when you're out there telling me what needs to be done. So we don't have any immediate plans, but do I see it as a need? Yes, particularly as we're moving into this $9 billion 2022 midterm election and the money's out there. Crypto is out there anyways. Hi, I'm Hi. Candace Norwood. I work for the 19th covering gender and politics. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is too 
I don't know if this is too similar to Kirk's question, but um, I was curious, I'm like casually interested in how, you know, like influencer culture influences different political discussions. And I'm curious if you've seen connections between like TikTok personalities, et cetera, and political um, candidates, are, are they, have you found situations where they're being paid to do certain advertisements related to candidates? And I'm wondering, like, just to get your thoughts on like what more regulation of like uh, of that could look like. Is that part of the internet disclosure stuff that you all are already working mm -hmm. on? And so, yeah, <laughs> just, if that makes sense, um, it does, and it's really a good and hard question to answer because we are in in the rulemakings that we're working on for internet disclaimers we are trying to eventualize where we think things are going but um you guys it's it's i just be honest with you it's really hard um we're not prepared for the explosion of technology that is happening we don't have uh, the regulations, if you read them now, were, like I said, written when Al Gore created the internet and, um, and it has not been expanded. And there is a unique fight to push against expansion for certain sides if you're more conservative because we, there's a stronger argument that you're regulating free speech. And, and, but I think that the difference in regulating contributions versus expenditures are, is always going to be the clear line that the court has set as the clear line. Candace, that, that does not answer your question, but I am happy to talk to you some more about it and um, see what we can do to figure out to make sure I get you an answer. Mm -hmm. Ben Siegel with ABC, Hi. thanks for being here. Um, two sort of different areas unrelated that I'm always kind of obsessed with in the FEC world. One is just the issue of campaign debt. Mm. Um, I think every year there's like a story. Every four years there's like a story about Newt, Newt Gingrich's campaign that still has like four million dollars in debt. Um, and um, <laughs> and then the other other question I have, or the other issue that I spent some time covering uh, last couple years ago was was the RNC's payments for legal fees mm -hmm. uh, for the the congressional Russia investigations. And I don't know if there's any more you can say beyond. You know, sort of what the decisions were on mm -hmm. on both those things, but maybe I guess on the on the debt issue, um, are there? I was just looking it up before I before yeah. I asked. I mean, are there consequences to that? Is that something that he can just sort of roll over indefinitely? Is there? I mean, are there any criminal implications to just criminal? like not paying these bills or something like that? <laughs> well, you and I don't pay our bills, and someone com comes and starts garnishing everything that well, we have. Well, that's but, what I, right. but I understand. <laughs> like, but well. <laughs> I will say the debt settlement program for the FEC has is also in that antiquated kind of stage where nothing has been updated on it. Um, I do have some hope that now that we have a commission of six, we can work on those things. Uh, the debt settlement, the only thing I can say is what happens for a debt settlement, a committee that tries to close, well, no, a committee that is not gone through a debt settlement plan to resolve those debts, through the commission's approved way is you're forced to stay open and you're forced to continue filing reports. It might seem kind of like, well, really how bad is that? But it's still the expense and the effort of it. So the, I don't know, I don't think it's really, do you think it's enough of a punishment to have to still file reports that basically just say zero, 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 half a million debt? I, I don't know that it does, but at least we hope it is giving some acknowledgement to the public, but we don't have anything on the, on the statutes or the regulations that allows us to go and target that. It's something that I think we'd have to go through a statute, um, a legislative recommendation to ask them to put that in place. And then think about it. Do you think they want to give an, maybe they do. It's like, okay, that if you don't finish paying your debts, we're going to continue to go after you, after you're no longer in office anymore. Now, if there was money left in your campaign, you can convert to uh, a leadership pack and a non-connect committee and use that as leverage for your own business of politics kind of thing. But it's a little, that's one of those unique situations that we don't have a law in the books 
and I think that it's a great idea and I want to take it and put it on the list, but I, I got to get some internet disclaimer regulation done first. <laughs> so. so I was wondering if there is a Mark Walk with the New York mm-hmm. Times. I was wondering in like the example you gave of like sort of the Weaveland Tubes case, mm-hmm. is there an arm of the FEC that sort of like looks into this, looks into foreign entities kind of using their, whether it's a shell company mm-hmm. or a legitimate company, to sort of like fund money into like, is that something that's actively going? Because I was actually the researcher on that story and that's kind mm-hmm. of one of the things that like, I wondered, it's like, oh, this is a good example right. of something that happened. I'm sure this, there's probably a lot of that going on, but like we're not finding it. I was wondering if there's any portion of the FPC that actually looks into that and actively digs into checking out the legitimacy of some of these larger donations. Uh, you want a quick answer? No. Um, <laughs> Look, like, the quick answer is no, not that there shouldn't be, but when you have an enforcement division that's probably comprised of 25 people now um, that are getting inundated with cases that they're, they're working on, we don't have a specific division. But I will say that the reports analysis division is very good at highlighting sometimes when this situation is coming available um, for funds. Now, they're not going to be the division that's going to say, oh, I noticed that this LLC went into that. They're just, they're not just, but they're looking at what is on the paper. It really is uh, you guys that are they're pointing it out for us and bringing it to the attention about what's happening. So good job on that case. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a quick follow-up question. Yeah. On, you mentioned like kind of sort of the growing amount of money being spent. Mm-hmm. If you go to the FEC page, you try and download the data. It only allows you to download so much or for like crashes okay. or like crashes your computer in the okay. process. Yeah. Is that like something that like the FEC is aware of and is working on? Because like I tried to download, especially in the Trump administration, like mm-hmm. downloading data and it would just like totally crash my computer. Oh, I'm not familiar with it, but it, I see you're telling me and I see another head shaking and I guess you guys. <laughs> so, <laughs> Mark, right, what, right. This is what I, I'd like to do. Like we do have a very good IT department that will probably work directly on that. Now, what I'd like to do is if you don't mind putting your question in writing so that I can and then email it to me, please. Gotcha. And I will send it to that division to let them know that I spoke to a room full of reporters and the majority, well, half of y'all shake your head so I can say majority, um, <laughs> said they encountered this problem. And if our user information is not clear and not accessible, then forget you guys, the regular person. <laughs> now, forgive me, like the, what I mean to say is if it's not workable for you, then if it is, you know, my parents in Louisiana trying to look at this stuff, they're not going to understand it either. So if you would, please, and yeah, I'd be I'll happy to take it to that division and see if what we can do to, to try to brainstorm and come up with that problem. We need that. Like, so if ever that comes up, let Judy know or call the information division. You guys call me. I'm, I can't answer, solve it, but I can send it to the right place. And that is something that I consider a responsibility that I should do. So please. Hello, um, my name is Matt I'm with the Washington Post. I, <clears throat> we've been talking a lot about like obviously the cutting edge stuff that's that's coming next. But I, um, apropos of news, over the past several years, but also some headlines recently, what is the FEC's policy in the 21st century on candidates giving voters money or gifts or vouchers? And how does that maybe in like how does that come into their filings and accusations of vote buying? Uh, candidates giving gifts for <laughs> votes. They, maybe, maybe they say they do. Maybe they say it. Maybe they're not. And also maybe PACs. That's an interesting question. But um, is there policy around this? Well, no, there is not a policy about it. But is there a regular statute that says? you know, giving contributions to the name of the other, giving for, is it in the FICA world? No, but I have no doubt that there should be some law out there that's telling us that we're not doing this. And it might go on a more state level as opposed to a federal level. Uh, but I wonder if we should be looking at the EAC in that instance for the Election Assistance Commission for the actual action of the votes. But one of the things I would say is that that would be an instance where you would need to dig through the operating expenses of a committee to kind of see how they label those things and see if there is an RFAI that was questioning 
some of the because there's a there's a committees have to list their expenditures in a certain way and you can't just say oh Chuck E. Cheese that day, whatever. Um, no, you you have to say it's consulting. It's this kind of consulting. It's whatever, whatever, whatever. So there may be an instance, and I don't know, but there could be an instance in a fine tune where an analyst is going through and is noticing some of those things in an RFAI. So if there is a committee that you're looking at, check those RFAIs, uh, and that might give you a clue. So that's the best that I could. You know, I want to be as helpful as, as possible to give you a suggestion that might be where you can you can start digging through the RFIs and the, the committees. If you opened up the RFIs, they have to respond specifically to the question and they have to either correct their reports or they're proven that they didn't do anything wrong. But dig through those. I've had cases where me on the inside, when I was the enforcement attorney, I got some of the best information is by going through the filings of the committee and looking at their responses to RFAIs and was able to use that. I mean, and, it, and it's almost one of those sad things where this, you know, what is that? Y'all might be too young for this, but you don't know what the head is doing and the tail is doing kind of thing. That sometimes can be the case because the RAD analysts are digging into the minutia of the, the information. A lot of times when you're an enforcement attorney, you're looking at the, the hard line numbers and everything. So I, I would suggest going there. Who are you closest to, uh, like, on the Hill, uh, you know, maybe in the Senate? And, and who would you talk to uh, in the administration, um, you know, for instance, if you had a legislative proposal? And, and what is the, uh, what generally is the, the process for that? Um, so I, I imagine it's like this for everyone. When you've gone through this process for the confirmation process, you do develop some relationships. Um, I'm probably, look, uh, I am the one of only two commissioners in the history of the agency to come from inside the agency. Uh, it generally doesn't happen this way. It usually happens when someone on the outside gets noticed and they work in the field and then administration. Um, me and Scott Thomas were people that were actually doing the work. And when they had an opening, someone came to me and said, are you interested? And I said, why not me? I've been doing it all this time. I might as well. You know, why not? So, um, but we have a legislative recommendations process with our legislative affairs director, Dwayne Pugh. And so what happens is over the course of a year, when we have issues that um, are not met within the statute and we don't have a regulation to that effect, we kind of build a rolling list of things to talk about. And you, through Dwayne's great efforts of keeping up, we have a house and we have a committee that we're under, the House Administration Committee, um, they, they, they kind of routinely reach out to us and say, tell me what you're doing on this. We noticed that a problem, with, for example, we noticed that there's a problem with um, like a year or two ago, scam pack things. What are you guys planning on doing about this? Tell me what you can do. And we have to respond to Congress within a number of days. And there've been some instances when they didn't like what we're saying and they're like, yeah, we're gonna have a hearing soon because we need to make sure you guys are on the ball. Um, and that's our job. But if there is a legislative recommendation process that we turn, it's got to be bipartisan, so it might not have everything. You should see what the list looks like when we start. It's like throw everything you want on the wall and then, sorry, kind of, but, but honest. No, you want honesty, you then come to me. So um, you throw everything that you want on the wall and then everyone throws everything and you kind of dig through those to say, I no, we can't do this, we can't do this, until finally we can come up with about 10 or 15 things that we agree with. And we then put that through our committee and you gotta you kind of hope and pray and then reach out and say, oh, I heard that you're interested in scam packs. Look, we have this recommendation. Can we, can we talk to you about it? Can we give you some more information? That's, you know, every single one of us are, are doing it that way. Uh, Daniel Dorsher from the Kansas City Star. Uh, so I have kind of a, a couple of things. Um, yeah. One, the website has gotten a lot better. Uh, it doesn't cross my computer as much anymore. <laughs> okay, so that it good. has improved. Um, but two, uh, so like a, a lot of times we'll see these things where uh, campaigns will use the FEC almost as if like a political tactic for earned media. They'll file a report mm -hmm. against their opponent, but because of how the backlog exists, nothing's going to happen by the time that election day rolls around. Except that committee had to use a lot of money to spend on yeah, their own to pay yeah. 
for lawyers and everything else. Sorry to interrupt your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, but so, I, I mean, I guess like my larger question, though, is like, when is the last time that the FEC has delivered a um, verdict against a candidate that's run? And like, how big is it? I mean, is it like $2,000 or like, what's the biggest fine you can think of that a candidate has actually gotten for some of these these violations? Like, and when's the last time you've seen it happen? Well, I feel like it happens all the time, but now you put me on the spot. But yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, but yeah like for example, remember. like the oldest one is Larry Craig. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Mr. Craig got sat with some nice penalties and fees and took it all the way to litigation, mm -hmm. which I would have, if I were his counsel, I'd have been like, just stop, yeah. you know, stop, stop at RTB and, and just settle this case. Um, we did have, there was uh um, APIC, sorry, when you, you know, when you're in the government, everything's in acronyms. Um, American Pacific is a case that dealt with the Jeb Bush campaign that did give a site to them for the acceptance of foreign national contributions. Um, but it wasn't specifically Jeb, it was his brother who was an agent of the campaign. So that is an instance. I guess what I'm getting at, like, yeah. is it, do you have an easier time getting these organizations, the PACs, the, the players, the LLCs, whatever, and holding them accountable than you do candidates? No, I think it's the opposite. Or? I think you have an easier time holding a candidate um, mm -hmm. responsible for actions rather than a PAC, because a lot of times with the PAC, who gave the money to the PAC? We're dealing with the LLC issue that I mentioned with the conduit contributions. So there, it's easier I, I believe, my opinion is, post Citizens United, it's easier to cover that through a PAC than it is for an authorized committee. The reporting for an authorized committee is far more detailed than it is for a PAC, you know? And, but the issue is, is that when you're an authorized committee, you have to kind of dig a little harder because operating expenses cover their expenditures and their advertisements and things like that. So that is why I say like, if you have a question about these reports, mm -hmm. like call, don't call the analysts. They can't talk to you guys. I mean, they're not supposed to, but whatever y'all do, I don't want to hear about it kind of thing. Um, but call the information division and ask them to explain that for you. And, and a lot of times we are very cooperative with the press to make sure that you can understand it. And if it's on our record and on our FPC website and you can't find it and can't understand it, then again, we're not doing anything with the mission that we have about transparency. So, but if that doesn't answer your question, and like I said, if I did not get what you needed to know and understand, I do invite you to email me. Now, I probably won't get back to you like in the next day or two, give me a bit, but I will find an answer for you and everything. I'm, I'm really happy to help you as you guys move forward in your careers. And everything. So. Commissioner Versailles, thank you so much for your time and your candor. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>